on the board with Justin in tow Wrapped up in burlap and off we did go We thought we'd give Canada well-deserved peace By sending Trudeau to a faraway place Him in his office grand. Oh, no, 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 placed in a burlap hand. Oh, no, 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 we've tried every island from here to the moon, but Justin returns like a catchy tune. Passive aggressively shitty. That's 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 the that's the extent of it. Yeah, well, everyone would say that Canadians are polite, but it's more of just um, an Anglo tradition of being reserved. Like it's just not being audacious. But it's never been politeness. Like British people are about as polite as Canadians are, but you would never call a British person polite. I think with in Canada you have two things going on simultaneously. Like, once you're a Canadian, you understand like inner Canadian sort of uh, knife fights. Everything's passive aggressive, so the idea is to kind of set you up to, for a fall, you know, and and be able to be the person go. Oh, I don't know why he's reacting that way. I I have no idea why he got so upset. That just seems so strange. And after you know, <laughs> the entire time you've been like knifing this person in the stomach the entire time, and finally you're very getting blows a twisted up. view of Canadians like these just treacherous Talmudic beings. That's not us. Yeah, we're we're good people. Canadians maybe, are maybe becoming not, real. Neck of the woods. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> Canadian, an, an actual Canadian right wing will be very interesting. And I think we're, you're about to see it. I think you might get a Make Canada Great Again movement, which would be interesting. I mean, that, that's actually a very big idea and a very big topic. Because when people hear Canadian right wing, especially if they're in Canada, they will intuitively compare themselves to America. It's like, we're going to have our Canadian version of the right in America. And to a certain extent, that's inevitable. But that's completely the wrong way of looking at it. And that's, you know, that's a discussion that's happening now on X and elsewhere saying, you'll, you'll notice a lot of Canadians saying we need a Canada first, a Canadian MAGA movement. I'm a Canadian Republican. I've seen a, a young woman who calls herself a Canadian Republican. So they're latching on to the Trump energy. But um, I know that there's that book I've referenced a couple of times called The Network State. And they have... Mm -hmm or he rather has the view of the left and the right as just a function of the state, meaning it's an axis, that the left and the right doesn't necessarily need to take on the character essence of any other right wing. It is completely within its own context. So there is a right wing in Canada right now. It's got many adherents. Um, it just doesn't look like the American one, and it doesn't really have that identity yet, but it is being worked on presently, and that's been my experience. And there's a lot of variations of what that looks like. And I think the one thing it shouldn't be is trying to copy America or really trying to copy any other right-wing movements from across time. Uh, I think that's asking the entirely wrong questions. And then that's more of a fandom, if anything, but it's not getting to the root of what Canadian identity is, which is a very, very complex question. But eventually, I think now, maybe more than ever before, there is a right-wing forming within the Canadian context. I think when you're growing up, you know, I'm, what, 47 now. But I'm also from Quebec, so that's a little bit different. But the standard Canadian identity, I guess, 
was sort of red green was in some ways um, Bob and Doug. I mean, they're obviously like they're abstractions and they're made to be a bit silly, but it was sort of that okay, like oh, we just you know uh, take care of each other, have some smokes, have some beers, watch watch the hockey, and don't don't sweat it, eh? Like that's kind of what was presented, and we almost all kind of agreed on that to a to a uh, greater or lesser degree. You know, Toronto people got the their stick up their ass and all that stuff. There's variations across across cities and provinces, but like. Um, there was a standardized idea of a like baseline Canadian. And I remember what really shook me, um, and I, I point to it as a massive radicalization point in my thinking, was watching the George Floyd protests outside my window in Montreal in the summer of 2020. To me, that just was like, this isn't Canadian. Like, this, what is going on? This is, this is, what, what? It just broke me, you know, in a lot of ways. COVID in general broke me out of that mentality that I understood what Canadian was all about because it, yeah, because it I, was like this is not Canadian. Yeah, I think that broke a lot of people um, in the sense that a lot of people would have found their, themselves on our side just through perhaps personal lived experience or research, or they got red pilled by something. But like, I don't know how you come out the other side of the George Floyd riots or COVID. Without, if you're being honest, at least a bit more on our side, which I think is what actually, in fact, did happen because it was unignorable. Um, but it's interesting with Red Green, um, the Red Green show, and also Bob Doug McKenzie, there is a through line there of being an outdoorsman or being a frontiersman. Um, and I think that there's something very true about that because also, you know, there's a sort of like a, a boomer sort of humor in this, which is like, we're easy going, ah, I hate my wife, you know, everyone, that entire generation just wants to drink beers and relax. Um, like, so did like Wayne's world in a sense, but you know, is Wayne's world indicative of the American character? Arguably not. When we respond to something like red green it's because that specific type of outdoorsy guy we see that all over the place. That's a very rural guy. It's not a construct. So the fact that he's kind of hokey and on a show or whatever, but there is an essence that you can grab onto that's not just fake, that maybe draws from something more substantive in the Canadian identity. Yeah, but I think that's where you can kind of see true cultural touchstones is when someone's not putting it on. You know, there's no... It's, it's authentic because the person doing it isn't thinking in third or fourth degrees kind of consequences. It's not a marketing ploy. It's not like they're trying to win anyone over. That's just who they are. When you're looking for authentic expressions of, let's say, a cultural identity through groups of people, you kind of want to go to people who aren't putting on a front. That uh, Canadian bro thing was the baseline. You have different versions of it in Quebec. The, you know, the Pepsi on the corner, ASD. But it's authentic. Like you, you can say you can you can thumb your nose at it. You can have your opinions about it. But you know it's not fake. Yeah, and also a lot of this Canadian identity that we're talking about draws from, in my opinion, a very European character. The idea of like you know smoking and drinking, and I detect a lot of Irish and Scottish influence in that, and also mm. a strong French influence, of course. So you know it's echoes of a European way of living and thinking more so than American. I think there's a there's there's something to be said for my American audience as well because right now we're at this in, interesting transition point where okay you have MAGA right and the MAGA crowd is the mimetic model going forward people can not like it or whatever but that's just it you're seeing more and more people switch over to at least being sympathetic to Trump if not full on endorsing doing the little dance right that little dance little little Trump dance thing he did. Uh, and shout out to Matt Erickson for pointing it out how brilliant it is. That's caught on everywhere. Everyone's doing a little dance, right? Yeah. So it's not so, like it was the first yeah. time, right? Not at all. It's going to culturally shift people. The question is, what is that culture shift going to be? When we start saying things like "Make America Great Again," or Canada, or Australia, or whoever, it's still harkening back to something. And it's, I think, it's very important to understand what you're harkening back to. Uh, what is what is what are the characteristics? What are the core principles that you're interested in promoting? Because I think a lot of times, what people, and especially in the dissident rights sphere, and not calling anyone out, I think it's just this is just how humans do, is that when you're on the losing foot for long enough, you get comfortable being a loser, and you kind of project your idea of what winning is. 
So you'll say things like, this culture is too degenerate. We need to get rid of degeneracy. And everyone goes, yeah, agreed. And then you're like, okay, how do you accomplish that? Do you just like arrest degeneracy? Do you, do you, you know, like you can pass laws, you can do prohibitions and stuff of that, but that entails a whole bunch of other levels of effect. I think what's more effective is you have to change the culture from the inside. And that kind of brings us to like wife jack, which is the meme of the day and everyone's having freaking opinions about it. But I'm looking at it, well, first of all, I don't care. It's a meme. It's, it, it is what it is. But I'm also looking at it like this is how it heals. This is how you go from degenerate culture, only fans, et cetera, to a moderate, healthier, less less degenerate society is wife jack. Like that's becomes the mimetic model. That's normal. And you kind of want people to be normal, right? Yeah. Um, I do think a lot of people have to die though. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I deep down I am sort of the, the Jonathan Bowden at here and like you, there is a lot of people you gotta fucking clear out uh, before the healing can begin proper however having said that I, I do, there is something to be said for your point which is that there is a mimetic organic way to go about this now Wife Jack is an interesting example because I almost look at that more as people overthinking it I know you had said you were somewhat ambivalent on the meme I am too but except my community for Blood Satellite, great show. They've show, been embroiled in a debate for like three fucking days over Wife Jack and Wife Guys as a result because you can be, it, the real problem is Wife Guys. Now it's incels versus Wife Guys. I have not been paying attention and I just peek my head over the fence of my own fucking space. And I'm like, I just thought it was a funny meme. Like, it, to, however, the, the, <laughs> the Wife Jack meme is very funny because if you look at the roots of it, the, the very first Wife Jack image on record was just a wife making a wojack of herself and she's like oh i thought this would be like a fun cute thing to do ha huh? so the first wife jack was a woman doing a wife jack type thing which is everyone's like oh she's just like a dumb bitch I'm like no nah, like you don't get it it's just kind of clueless but well meaning maybe a bit naive you know to me there was a peak of the wife jack meme because every meme has its it's like fruit, it ripens, and then immediately starts rotting. Mm -hmm. And some people just like the rotted memes, like me. I love a rotted peach. I love a deep-fried hunk of shit that doesn't make any sense, and it's just schizophrenic. The best Wife Jack meme was just the image, and the quote was something like, is that supposed to be me? There, done. <laughs> That's the best. It, it became meta, and then that you did it. It's, it's like the end of South Park was that episode, You're Getting Old, because it was a commentary on South Park itself. That's like the unofficial end, hard stop. Anything after that is just rot. I do like the spinoff, because there's, you also know what, when things are getting a little bit stale, because they always have the spinoff, and the spinoff always, always usually involves a kid. Um, and so the, the ones with the daughter, uh, daughter Jack, or whatever, I don't know what the term is for her, are delightful because I have a daughter. I'm like, yep, that's exactly how that is. Oh, yeah, that that's, was funny uh, because it was like, here's the wife being confronted with herself and how she responds to it. You know, it, at the end of the day, then it's not a meme and then it's just we're doing comics now, you know what I mean? But right. I, I, I like it. I don't, to me, I don't think we need 50 sub stacks on it. I don't think we need a discourse on it. To me, this is like our entire generation is just working our way back to making far side comics. You know, this is I just, also, oh, my wife, here's my wife doing something. Here's a cat <laughs> that's saying an, an irreverent thing. Like, it's just the same shit, which is fine. I like it. It's it's kind of wholesome, but I don't think everything needs to be a barometer of cultural decay or resurgence. And may, maybe right. I'm being cynical here. I just I just think it's a cool thing, and I didn't expect that it would end with saying that, uh, yeah, if you, if you have a wife, that's actually gay. I'm like, okay. We're just we're do, we're doing a thing. This is the big thing now. No one's having fun. Everyone's pissed off. Hooray! I thought we could have like a. I thought we could have fun for five minutes. Turns. Why would I think that? It's why I've left a lot of spaces recently. The stupid loser ant smell was it was seeping into my clothes. It was just like, wait a minute. You're telling me in a world where Vladimir Putin just unveiled his supersonic missile device that can launch up to eight warheads independently that could actually obliterate cities without even a payload attached because they're going to hit them that hard. And he's just basically slung his dick on the table and said, hey, UK, hey, France, dare me, right? That just happened this week. And then I turn on Twitter and find out people bitching about Wife Jack. I'm like, yeah, why is you? everyone upset? We're what? getting World War Three. I thought that's what right. we wanted. 
This is so much more exciting. <laughs> yeah, I felt we're, we're we're doing the bit. If you're an accelerationist, this is great. Like right. all all of our most wicked technologies coming to bear. Great, we're something's going to happen. If hey, do you like Fallout? What if Fallout was gayer? That's what you're going to be living in. You thought the show was gay? Well, guess what? This is one where you don't get cool robots. Oh, hey, there's there's an extension of the wife jack. Do the Fallout mutant wife jack. <laughs> Yeah, again, see, we're just contributing to, to the, the pain, Jason. <laughs> well, some, you know what? I've done a whole bunch of stuff taking shots at the merchants of despair, but sometimes I see their point. I'm like, you know, a little bit of despair is good for people, I think. It's it's good to overcome. It's like a little bit of suffering. You just gotta, what, what's you gotta your take on the meme? You, you, you said it's sort of we're healing now, and uh, I, well, I just saw it as a positive thing too. Like, hey, guys are... Young guys are kind of making, I, I don't want to call it wholesome. I don't like that word really. But I'm like, yeah, it's just guys saying like, hey, my wife does a goofy thing. Then you say, ha, yeah, I, I know that. And you kind of go about your day. But what, what does it signify to you? That's kind of what I felt about it. Is like When I first started seeing it prop up a few weeks or whatever ago, I was like, oh, ha, huh. oh, that's funny, right? Like it was one of those like chuckle funnies. It's not like, I'm not going to lose my shit over it. It's just, it's like, oh yeah, mildly amusing. And I get I get what you're doing and that's, yeah, it's good. We need more of this. And not necessarily we need more wife jack memes, but we need just more things like everyone just like calm down. Everything's been ratcheted up to 12 for a while now. And things are getting spurgy. In a weird way, wife jack is becoming a litmus test, but it's becoming a litmus test of the world you want to live in. I would much rather live in a world of wife jack than a world of anti-wife jack, whatever the hell that is, right? All this fervor over Trump's picks and stuff, nothing's actually happened yet. And people are talking about it as if, oh my God, it's all doomed, or oh, it's great, and the fifth, fifth dimensional chess and all this other stuff. It's like, guys, just it's going to happen very soon, right? In a few weeks, it's, it's, things will actually start happening. And then you can go, wow, okay, let's judge the happenings. Yeah, Let's look at guys, what they're actually doing. Spoiler alert, Trump's probably going to let you down in ways that are going to surprise you. And that's okay. Because you had mentioned at the top something very interesting happened, which is that you know Trump has wider acceptance than he ever has, which is actually bad news for us radical mm-hmm. schizos out there. Because a lot of his policies that made it exciting the first time, he doesn't really have those anymore. You know, he's still hard on migration, but he does not have the energy or vigor as the first time around. And he's less interesting to people like myself. That's why he's so popular. So a lot of his opponents and enemies and liberals have, in fact, gravitated a bit more towards our side out of necessity, right? So that's a win. However, he has also gravitated towards them. So everything's gone a bit better, also gone a bit worse for us, but that's where it is. So I'm pragmatic. You'll notice something about Trump. It's that everyone's kind of less excited. The only people who are equally as excited are kind of like the Twitter guys, but I don't know if you've checked in on QAnon. There's not the shellacking of Trump that there once was, because if you remember, QAnon and his most fervent supporters, they were talking about 5D chess. Everything was part of the plan. To me, I don't even see any of the lore or mythology that Trump is playing extra dimensional chess this time around. They are a bit more realistic because nothing they predicted ever happened. So, so that's gone. Like the true worship of the God Emperor is absent. There's just this sort of like fake excitement that, well, the the fake excitement is about something a lot darker, which I appreciate, which is we're just going to kill them. We're just going to kill liberals. Like that's what's going on in X right now. All the people saying, um, aren't you a hypocrite for Trump did this and you did this? Like, that's cool. I'm going to shoot you in the head. Like that's what people are saying <laughs> to each other now. It's like, yeah, I don't care. I'm a hypocrite. I'm going to liquidate you. You're going to be biofuel. That's what people, that's what normal Republicans are fucking saying some of the time. And I'm like, I like that. I like that some people just had their minds broke. However, I think we do need to be realistic about Trump while recognizing that there's a flood of interest coming into our space and we need to reckon with that because this is, we've won a lot of the discursive skirmishes that we were involved in, but a lot of us didn't plan for that victory. So now we are getting an influx of, the smart libs and the smart leftists 
who are trying to figure out like why is it that we lost? Well, then they're trying to dissect the things that worked for us, and we need to be very careful about that, especially yeah. post left types who are coming into this space and bringing a lot of weird ideological baggage. I mean, I wouldn't say I was on the left by 2020. I had kind of divulged, you know, diversified my thinking away from that before that. And not that I was ever really on the left anyways. It was just more about Canadian, standard Canadian liberal, you know, which is just like healthcare, good. <laughs> the Charter of Rights and Freedom, good. Um, you know, basic sludgy. Th- I, I guess I, I've, I've admitted this. I, I stayed inside of a 90s mindset for a very embarrassingly long time because my life didn't challenge me to think anything otherwise. Canadian politics was just kind of drab and, you know, it worked. Uh, There was no reason to get really all that worked up about it. Uh, You know, by the end of Harper's uh, term, I guess I got a bit more like, fuck Harper, but it was more like that guy creeps me out. I don't know if something about him is unnerving. Like, I... He, he doesn't blink. That's that's that that should be that uh-huh. should be a red flag. And I proposed Trudeau because I was like, well, I I like the charter. The charter's good, right? That's that's a good thing. Uh, and his dad helped write it, so he's going to defend it, and that's good. And then you know, six months or whatever in, he does Bill C sixty, and I'm like, shit. Okay, who's this Jordan Peterson guy? <laughs> and that was really yeah. like kind of my my entire political off ramping and on ramping at the same time. You know, I mean, I'd, I'd already been in the weeds for a long time by that point, but um, yeah, and once I noticed that a lot of people were they're very excited about Justin Trudeau and none of them had any reason to. They're just like, he's just, he had name recognition. They liked his hair. Uh, He got a lot of votes for people who just wanted to legalize weed. Like a lot. Like most of the people in my life, like, yeah, we can finally legalize it and nothing fucking changes because it was already pretty much legal anyway. But like, he got a lot of idiotic votes and then nothing's really changed. And I was like, oh, we got him this time. His... His popularity is an all-time low. I'm like, yeah, well, I guess we'll see. He really, he really hung on there. He should have been gone by now, but he hung on. That's why, like, once he got reelected, I think like the second time or something. I'm like, I, I am not represented anywhere. I guess I'm in the minority. Like, what do you do with that information? It's very disheartening. Like Trudeau kept getting voted back in like, with significant margins, and the People's Party of Canada, for example, did it. I'm like, okay. To be fair, the, the PPM is. I mean, I don't even know where to start with that. To, to me, they're just like a slightly right wing version of the NDP. Like they, they're going to serve the same purpose. You know, basically audience capture uh, a bunch of people who just you know are slightly to the right of the of the conservatives, or don't like. Uh, Pierre Poulevev or whoever the hell they're putting up there now. Like none of these people, for example, are ever going to go after healthcare, right? Not a single person on that. If you put all the major leaders of every single major uh, uh, Canadian political party up on stage and ask them what they thought about Canadian healthcare, they would defend it to the dying breath. And I'm not saying that that is necessarily a good or bad thing or whatever. We can get into that, but it's, that's a spurred conversation anyways. You could get but, to that if once the boomers are gone. You could actually mount an attack on universal health care, but it's only after that generation is gone, see, which would be relatively that. soon. I don't know about that. I think it's so ingrained. It's it's the one thing Canadians can say that they have that America doesn't. And it's, But at a certain so point, ingrained. like they have to admit that it sucks. Like It is bad. It is bad quality. Like I've watched people with like cancer suffer unnecessarily. Like every stereotype right. every American has about Canadian healthcare, it is fucking true. And most people don't, most young people don't have to deal with it because you don't really enter into the hospital ecosystem until you're in your 40s in any real way. Right. You're invincible up until the age of like 35, basically. So this is just an abstract proposition. But like once you're in it, you realize that, oh, most of what I need actually isn't covered, and this entire system is fucking broken. And it, like the Americans were fucking right, and I actually can't do anything about it anymore. So I think, yeah. if, if, and especially like what the boomers are cling to this because they need it. But I think younger generations will be sufficiently radicalized. Where I'm not even saying that they will, but I think it'll be on the table in a way that couldn't have been previously because. I don't think most young people believe that there is going to be a glide path in the retirement period. I think if you ask them right now, they're not going to enjoy the experience of the boomers because the universal healthcare system, just like the um, you know, social security system, 
I really think most people at, at the very, even if it's right or wrong, they do believe that they will not be afforded that sort of economic certainty because they never had economic certainty their entire life. So they'll be like, well, why do I even want universal health care? Because it's going to be bad. And it's not going to, I'm not going to get anything out of it. So I'm just going to try and get mine. I'm going to try and extract as much money back from the system. And I, I, I at the very least think that there's millennials and Gen Z who would be willing to vote on these propositions. But I mean, we'll see, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if 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 what Stormy, myself, and Tom Luongo are all talking about, amongst a growing number of others, it may not be even an election issue. It might just have to go away, or be massively restructured, anyways. Because if what we're looking at with the sovereign debt collapse, and it, that is, that's going to massively affect Canada when those markets fall, unless they, there's a hail mary, literal economic miracle, that's now a, that's becoming a certainty, or has been a certainty for a while. When that happens, a lot of the things that these socialized systems depend on are going to go poof. And once all that settles down, and who knows what happens and how it plays out in the, over the next few years, but once things have settled down, I don't think people are like, well, let's just rebuild that thing that was broken yeah. and shitty anyways. Pre- right? Precisely. And, and we have um, an article up on my site, the Vanguardist Journal. That's vanguardistjournal.com. It's also on Substack. I wrote it with a friend of mine named Sean Weiland, called the cross-generational power transfer engine. And it's, um, in short, how to transfer all the captured wealth from boomers into younger generations while it's being hoarded. And uh, one thing we get to in that article, and Sean Weiland and many others talk about this as well, but how much the current social security system is being kept artificially afloat by you know financial manipulation. And I don't need to get into the whole thing right now. I, I bet Stormy talks about this in some sense, but like... The phenomena that boomers are experiencing almost can't be replicated. I believe Sean Weiland makes the point where it's like Social Security and this whole system is designed to go bankrupt. You're just hoping that you die before it does. Like it it is going to end at some point. It's just how badly. And I think there's more people who are just – this doesn't mean the entire economy is going to collapse. I'm just talking about – healthcare and social security and like the welfare state as we know it, because in Canada, especially as you've just indicated, there's no reason to believe this survives another 50 years. Like within our lifetimes, I just don't see that the the numbers don't compute anymore. And people are kind of ringing the alarms and they're trying to acclimate young people to be like, yeah, maybe you'll work till you're 90. Maybe you'll work till you're 90 in a tiny home. (laughs) You know, <laughs> we're building favelas and they're trying to sell you like, well, that's home ownership. Isn't that exciting? Like they've already baked this into the cake <laughs> of your future. And uh, I, I think people are, are noticing that, oh, you're not even like the, 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 the lifestyle, the Canadian dream, the lifestyle that we were promised. Like you're admitting to me that that's not even on the table anymore. I think people don't understand how powerful they, these things are. And maybe because I'm a bit older, I, I don't, I'm not connected to the Zoomers unless it's online. I, I can only kind of guesswork at the mentality or the vibe or the whatever's going on there. But increasingly, people are going to have to wake up to the fact that that promissory note is bankrupt. I'll give you an example. I believe it was uh, either in 2019 or 2020, somewhere around there. The Quebec Retirement Fund, the Provincial Retirement Fund, almost went bankrupt like literally had to be bailed out, emergency bailout. And the reason why is because Cirque du Soleil went bankrupt. And an embarrassingly large amount of the um, Quebec retirement fund was basically invested. The entire province invested. of Quebec is basically a company town for Cirque du Soleil at this point. Well, no, not no, no more because Cirque du Soleil is insolvent. <laughs> but it was, it was like Cirque du Soleil and Bombardier. And both those companies are now like completely BTF would So they had to get like incredible amounts of bailouts. And that was a huge marker for me. Even before I knew all the other stuff that I know now, that was always like a hmm data point. Like how did that happen? That sounds crazy. Do you mean you had everyone's retirement fund based on a circus? <laughs> There's no way to explain that where it doesn't sound hilarious. <laughs> you bet the farm on the gayest French circus the imaginable. <laughs> It's like super gay bottom and barely. Like, can you? What, what if it's a circus, but it's also horny and gay and French? <laughs> That'd be like telling your wife that I bet the mortgage on a zoo. Like, what? What did you do? What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, it's also like, That's... you know, Cirque du Soleil, it's a big company, but even during its heyday, I'm thinking like, this, this isn't going to last forever. There's only so many trapeze stunts you can do before people stop showing up. Well, yeah, or like, you know, imagine financing your entire 30, 40, 50 year plan on like Zemfir or like... <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> he's a quality musician. He'll be around for forever. Come on, yeah. proven track record. Look at these gold albums. <laughs> Well, number one of the pan flutes consecutively every year. He just kills the whole thing. How would you? That's smart money. I just, I don't know how you else would you think about it. <laughs> where are we going with this? We, we had a point to this where we got lost. Oh, Montreal's on fire. That's where we're going. Montreal's on fire this past week. And I'm recording this on, uh, I'll use the Australian date, November 27th of 2024. And uh, just recently, I'll pull up the. Uh, Gazette article and just read from it for you kind folks. Cars burned, windows smashed at pro-Palestinian anti-NATO demonstration in Montreal. Montreal police said three protesters were arrested for allegedly assaulting a police officer and interfering with police work. I won't read the whole thing, but you kind of get the idea. I'll just read the first, just below the fold here. Three people were arrested after pro-Palestinian anti-NATO protesters smashed windows, clashed with police officers, and set vehicles ablaze on Friday evening. The protests coincided with the arrival of approximately 300 delegates from the NATO member states and partner countries attending a high-level summit uh, running from November 22nd, 22nd to 25th in Montreal, focused on Ukraine, climate change, and the alliance's future. The protests also came as a second day of a wave of student-wide pro-Palestinian protests across Montreal. Uh, what was notable, and this is what kind of has been attached to this story, is at the same time this was happening, Justin Trudeau, I'm not sure why he wasn't at the NATO summit, but he was at some concert. I don't know. Uh, it was a Taylor Swift or something. It was a Taylor Swift uh, concert. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> dancing, with, uh, dancing with minors while part of the downtown core of Montreal was in flames. You know, the funny thing is, like, in the past, I would have said, oh, he's only going there for a photo op, but I think he is just a gay loser deep down, and I was excited when he got divorced for like right. a few minutes because I'm like, this guy's going to bring like a cool divorced energy. Like a just divorced guy is a wild card. And maybe he turns it around. <laughs> maybe he starts like making women pissing illegal. You don't know what's going to happen. It's like Trump getting shot in the head. <laughs> what's he going to do next? You don't know what that does to a man. And apparently nothing happened. He just, he's the same fucking guy. That, that blew my mind. I'm like, okay, then you're inhuman at that point. You can't right. divorce a woman and not become cooler. Get a sports Thanks. car at least, like just yeah. a few. He's got money. Fucking he can, he just a weird that. guy. And then yeah, so so to me, it's just his popularity is so low. I just don't think he gives a shit anymore. Um, and you right. had made a point that he's even becoming harder on immigration. Maybe you're going to cover that next. Um, because well, I think there's a lead goes, into that. Yeah, yeah. But basically, it's like oh, you look at him. He's like, yeah. I mean, this is it's just more to the pile. Like, it's, it's been the same outrage for so many years. I'm like, yep, he's dumb. He did a dumb thing. He's embarrassing. He's dancing like a fucking queer. I get it. Like, that's him. And he's still here. He's been here the whole fucking time. He hasn't changed one iota. I just hate this motherfucker, and I hate everyone in that system. I hate everyone in the Liberal Party. I want them all constructed into a nice house for the homeless. How about that? <laughs> I wanted them 3D printed. I wanted them to be put into crystals. I want the Canadian crystals. They're, they'll be made out of um, out of maple syrup. They'll be fully biodegradable. It's, it's fun. It's good. It's good for the environment. We can turn them into energy sources. I think it's a win-win across the board. Yeah, but even like Polyev, that fruitcake. You know, we need to, you know, ax the tax. No, like if you want my vote, you should be saying we should draw and quarter him, right? <laughs> like you should, like it, it's, a, it's a global embarrassment. And so what are you going to do about it? Like, what, what, does he get to retire? Some Someone needs to be punished for this shit. Yeah, and now well, he's, he's trying to do an about face. He's trying to, like, try and get us on on his side. But nope, not happening. Well, I think recently, so recently he's in a, he did this whole big sit-down, which was patroni patronizing. And like, it was just, I, 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 I only watched about 35 seconds of it and I had to, had to read it because uh, I was like, I can't. I can't with this guy. Um I might have to fly out to, to, to Canada to deal with this. And it's a 30-hour flight, and I got a bad back, so I'm not doing that. Um, but 
he recently announced that uh, Canada is going to put a pause on the mass immigration they've been doing in the country and uh, reassess and give everyone a time to you know to readjust and get get used to the new normal. Of course, this announcement happened pretty much on the foothills of Donald Trump's election. Matthew Erickson over King Pill speculated this morning, and I, I tend to agree with him. I think he's just getting ahead of the curve of knowing that there's a whole bunch of immigrants who are going to be flowing north. You know, he doesn't need to have immigration abroad. He just has to open up the freaking border or not close the border, and suddenly you have a truckload of uh, very fine cultured people swarming into southern parts of, of Canada. If, if the Canadian welfare state collapses and those people self-deport anyway, see, one of the, one of the greatest things I, I witnessed was, I don't know if you watch this stuff, but there's uh, you know, dozens of videos on YouTube made by Indians listing all the reasons they're going back home because oh, Canada yeah. sucks apparently. And I'm saying, aha, right. yeah, get out of here. But they are right. Third worlders are coming to Canada and saying, I can't tolerate this. That's not good. You know, it is, it is a harsh, punishing place where it's difficult to survive financially. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's not attractive to live here. So, ha-ha. <laughs> and well, then it's going to get worse. And then they're going to leave. And then we're going to be stuck in the mess that the welfare state still collapsed because of them and because of the political elites causing it. And the only ones who are going to be stuck with it are us. It's like you have to generate a cultural identity that insulates you from the reality of living in Kamloops or Sudbury in order to live in Kamloops and Sudbury. Like it becomes a point of freaking pride. Like no one really actually wants to live in New Brunswick. It's like you're born in New Brunswick and you live there and then you make it a big you make it a prideful thing. I mean, and there's like the Cabot Trail's nice, and the, yeah, sure, right? But like, there's lots of woods everywhere. Yeah, but, I find that know. there's more love towards small towns in Canada than the U.S., and that sounds like a pretty extreme statement. But I think that in America, they will glorify almost the simulacra of a small town, like a Bruce Springsteen right. version of a small town, maybe one that no one ever lived in. But there is a deep connection with the Kamlooses with. Or, or not, maybe not that exact, and the Kamloops is a city, but like these smaller towns and villages where people, real people are from them, and you do remember them. It's not a movie version of it because there's more of those types of places than there are large urban centers. There's really only a few in Canada. The rest of the country is relatively small towns and villages. Yeah, and full of meth. And I mean, how can you how how can you say no to that? I think it's charming, really. Especially bad in Quebec. Like you go to a small town Quebec, and you're like, "Wow, I, you can count the number of teeth in this town. That's amazing!" Like there's, it's like per capita, there's twelve of them. Teeth. Yeah, I mean. and, and you need to hate that. You need to hate that that's happened. And there's a lot of people on the right, especially in the identitarian sectors, who have a disgust towards ruralites and disgust mm. of what they see as sort of low status rural types or, you know, their countrymen. And I don't. I think you need to have an affection for them and a real one, not say, you know what, the opioid crisis, is it's a shame. It's a real shame. No, you need to have a visceral hatred for whoever did this to these people, whoever's facilitating this, this cancer that is relatively new to the region. And it can't just be a statistic. You need to feel that. You need to care about people. If you don't care about people, we don't need you. We don't need people who just want to be celebrities. We don't need people who just want to talk and have a sub stack. You need to give a shit about people and your people, even when they're at their worst. And there's not a lot of people who do that. And that fills me with disgust. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I put something out recently. I don't know if you heard it, but I, uh, I took it down because it, it was almost verging on too vulgar even for me. But it was a direct shot across the bow for some people. And essentially it was that. It was like, I'm getting really disgusted, like viscerally disgusted with the fact that Elon Musk says that we, you, us, whatever, are the media now. And you have people in our sphere and just in general sphere who have these big giant platforms and big giant audiences who have spent the last 10 some odd years or five years or whatever it is building up all these connections and resources and perfecting and honing a craft and then they do nothing with it. They talk about the wife Jack mean. You can talk about the wife jack meme and be doing stuff. It's not exclusionary. But if you have yeah. this big giant platform and you're spending time on the wife jack meme, I don't know why you. 
and it's just like, oh, you want to be the next Young Turks. You know, you're going to slag, um, you know, Pacman or some of that, but that's what you want to be. You just yeah. want him gone so you can take that spot. And you Here's fucking the thing. Let me just say, me. with the Young Turks, I do. <laughs> I've got a strange fixation on Cheng Uyghur just because I think <laughs> if we spend a long weekend with him, I think he comes out the other side of that as a different type of Alex Jones. I think he's right. got enough psycho in him where I'm like, I, I could kind of, tw- we can tweak him a little bit. He comes out as just a, a, that same type of gorilla and we could use two of them. But the rest of those people I don't like. Uh, they, they form what we might call content plantations. And right. this yes. is endemic on both the right and the left. And this is something for our money that we try and avoid doing. Like we don't make our primary revenue off of our show so we're not really beholden to the audience and we don't beg and try and wring money out of them but another thing it's that when you try and keep people on a content plantation some people might call it monetizing outrage that's one way to describe it but you realize that all my income from these people i need to keep them here i need to keep them paying me so i need to just keep this cycle going at a certain point you stop acting in their best interests Mm -hmm. and you start just kind of ginning up outrage or or like the whole wife jack thing is this really an issue or is this a monetizable discourse is this just something because people ding. make money off of their tweets so it's just i mean if your entire existence is just engagement farming and there's people who do that you're scum to me because that's no life to live you might as well be a bureaucrat it would be more honorable to be a state bureaucrat than to be an engagement farmer on, even if you're saying my side, if you're saying the things that I like, you're still just, expo- I don't want to say exploiting, but manipulating people and actually driving them a bit more insane. You know, you're actually working against people's interests. So you know, it was a funny example of that. Um, and this is an ongoing discussion, this ongoing investigation rather, is that Tenet Media, you remember uh, Lauren Chen's? Mm-hmm. So yeah. here's a good example of what you're talking about, which is we've got Tenet Media, who hosted our favorite bitch, Lauren Southern. But then you got your Tim Pools, then you got your Lauren Chance, and then there's a few other people in there. Dave Rubin. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dave Rubin. <laughs> the who's who of, you know, fucking... Sensible gays. All, just a bunch of sensible gays. It's Will and Grace, okay? It's the <laughs> and thing. Yeah. And, and so look at Tim Pool. Look at him! The t- tenant media... It got in trouble because it was seemingly accepting a lot of money from Russia, which would make sense because there's no reason why Tenet Media should have had so much money because it was paying its influencers and its broadcasters so fucking much. And I believe the uh, the number given to Tim Pool, the Tim Pool show, nobody's favorite show, was like $100,000 Per, I want to say per episode. That sounds crazy, but like per month, I think it, let's say. Yeah, it was, no, I think it was either Tim Poole, maybe Tim Pool and Dave Rubin. I think it was Dave Rubin who finally asked some questions and that kind of sparked a bunch of stuff from my yeah, understanding but, of it. But and, the, and it sorry, makes, the, the, the thing was to get, to do produce four episodes of a certain content and they were going to pay him four, sorry, $100,000 per episode. So essentially $400,000 USD for four shows in one month. That was, Which is that was an insane deal. amount of money and you don't need to be a content spur to know that those numbers don't add up. But it makes sense when you look at Tim Pool's compound. So here's a guy who was given the golden ticket. Every influencer, every take seller, everyone who makes some type of bread with content, imagine getting that money. What would you do with it? What would you, Jason, do with what? $400,000 in a month? Well, I'll tell you what Tim Pool did. He made a giant compound. (laughs) He bought a giant compound for him and like his team of 15 people to produce his fucking podcast and built a skate park inside of it that I assume just he uses. So he did the most, and then funded, you know, a rock music video that he got to star. (laughs) Like it's just the the worst things. If you gave a child that money, they would spend it less frivolously. But these are the types of people who are, they're the ones who made the plantations because this is a guy who's bringing nothing to the table. He's got no plans. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want anything from anyone except money to live out his strange, childish dreams. But if given the golden ticket, it never even crossed his mind to do something good with it. It never came across his mind to build something, like you were saying, of substance, 
to if he is on the right wing. I think one of the qualities you have to be in our space is you have to have a longer time horizon. You need to have that lateral connectedness in some sense with your people. Even if you are a leader, you need to have that interconnectedness. And then if you are that person, you will have ideas that emerge and things you could do with that capital out of the drop of a hat. There's been leaders throughout time who did that, but no one on the side can do anything except enrich themselves. So no one is equipped to have a windfall of cash. None of these motherfuckers. And every time it's happened, they've just either spent it on themselves or used it to just facilitate the more extraction from money from these people who already don't have, who are sometimes some of the most oppressed people in society. So, well, I called this, I called this out, I guess maybe a month or so ago. And I said that in very short order, I would say over the course of the next even six months to a year, times, everything's speeding up incredibly fast now. I think within the next year or so, you're going to find a lot of people who you thought were based are, are not based when they're given the gibbs. All of a sudden, they'll jump ship to wherever gets them positioning. Because it's not even about the money. People think it's about the money. It's not really about the money. It's about the influence and relevancy. I'll tell you one factor you can look at and understand where my thinking goes from with this. Barack Obama looked like crap when he was uh, stumping for Kamala Harris. There was a definite air of panic in his face. Didn't look like he was eating right or sleeping right or whatever, right? He looked pretty rough. And what I read in his eyes was that glimmer of like, "Uh oh, my relevancy is gone. That's those $100,000 state dinners where they just get paid millions of dollars to show up and do a 15-minute speech and you know put it in their foundation or some of that and just pocket it and live like Riley in your weird, perverted Martha's Vineyard mansion. That's that relevancy going away. So to tie this back to Trudeau and all those fine chuckle fucks, what the win condition for me isn't about me winning. is isn't about this show becoming a major thing. So I don't care about that. I don't want your fame. I don't really want a lot of money. I can operate on a very tight budget. I have been for many years. So what do I want? I want to see, I don't even want to see Justin, I would love to see Justin Trudeau and Shane's. But if that's not a possibility, I want to see it so that Justin Trudeau can't even get a fucking invite to a dinner party. I want it so that Justin Trudeau's name, his entire legacy, Everything about him is beyond cringe, like nobody. And I'm not talking just the average Canadian voter. I'm talking about everybody from every part of the hierarchy looks at him like a diseased rodent. You know what's funny? They, that is what's going to happen to Obama. That I, right. I truly believe that my grandchildren, when Obama is brought up, they're going to say, oh, that gay Kenyan? Right. Like he's lost... <laughs> He's lost control of the narrative. They had to use so much media pressure to make Obama seem like he's cool. That's gone. And I think just the memes about Obama are going to overtake whatever public rehabilitation he's going on with his fucking Netflix shows. He's just like a weird guy. No one no one actually likes Obama. It's going to be like, oh, yeah, that gay Kenyan man who kind of talks like a stroke victim trying to sound like a TV announcer. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> you get to watch his legacy drain from his face. Well, that's what I'm praying happens to Trudeau. That's such a degree that, yes, like our grandkids and our great-grandkids, you know, permanently reduced to a Jimmy Carter status. Even if you found out that Jimmy Carter secretly cured cancer and they just kept the cure from everyone, everyone would be like, yeah, but Jimmy Carter, though. Like, uh, it, 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 Just to go back to your original question about how this relates to Canada, what I like in America, and I understand that, these things I'm saying might sound pretty out there. You know, I speak only for myself. One thing I liked about the tone and tenor of Project 2025 is that I think you would call it the vengeful sun, mm-hmm. but it's, it's, it's that clear them out energy. It's that, you know, you have one year. It's that energy. You know what I started doing? I started reminding people of that Robert E. Lee statue that was burned. You remember that? Remember mm-hmm. the images of the red hot face and how mystical that seemed? And everyone said, never forget. Everyone forgot. We, everyone forgets everything from like six months ago. But I'm like, no, remember how fucking mad you were. And now he's back. I, I want that image to haunt them. You need to remember how mad all this shit made you. 
and I think that's lacking in Canada. Like I said, the things I'm saying about the, the political class here, people aren't as mad as I think they should be. I think they're pissed off if they've had enough. Like that's nowhere near what I think the average Republican feels in America right now towards the establishment, towards their opponents. And I think they, for the first time, maybe the first time ever, the Republicans actually see the Democrats as their existential enemies and they're acting accordingly. And I don't think the right in Canada sees the left as his existential enemy. I don't know. It's just a lot weaker. I just, and I know some people might balk at that and say, no, no, there's people like, I get it, but you have, everyone understands it's not like in America. And I think if there's anything we could take from America, it's that people up here need to be angrier. Like, why aren't you actually angry at Trudeau? Why aren't you angrier at what they did to at, at the, the persecutions of the trucker protesters, like the Coates trial. Weren't you still furious about human rights tribunals? That's everything's still fucking there. We should be, we should be as livid as these Palestinian protesters. You know, I mean, why is it just them? Why do I have to wait for the Palestinians and gay communists to show up before anyone gets pissed off? I'm sick of relying on the Palestinians to move the needle. Good question. I see it happening in America. I see the rhetoric at that place where it should be. And it's not here yet, at least not on a scale that you would think it would occur. In Canada, it's incredibly hard to create a scapegoat because they, we've internalized it. I bring up that socialized medicine thing and how there is no divide politically with any of the parties on it, at least not officially. Who knows privately what they think. When Harper even brought up the idea of bringing in some privatized medicine into Canada, he was trounced. And he had to rescind everything. That tells you something because it's in us. One of the things I'd say about the vengeful son, and this is why it's dangerous, is because it's going to feel good and it's going to be in all of us. Because that desire to tear it down, to do harm, to to enact your vengeance on the world and feel justified and righteous is inherently a good thing in some ways. It's true. And in many ways, it is 100% justified. The problem is, is that the only way you can bring justice to the world is by loving it. Da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to call back to what you were saying about to be really right wing, you got to love the townies. You got to love them all, right? You got to love your countrymen. Which also and, doesn't mean you need to love like criminals or anything like that. No, you know what I mean? Like there are those well, who transgress, who, you know. So just to, well, the, I know what some people might be auto-completing there. There's a difference between punishment and discipline. And this is something that I think people have lost the distinction on. We discipline people who we love and wish to bring back into the fold. So with your child, you love your child. You realize that sometimes your child gets disordered, either because they don't understand or because they make mistakes or whatever have you. So you discipline your child to bring them back into order. Because you want your child to be one part of the family, obviously, but like you, you want them to grow and be better. You punish those you hate or who you no longer care about bringing back into society. So the question really comes down to, are we punishing or are we disciplining? Yeah, that's a good point and something I've discussed on our show before and also our community. And I think there's a percentage of our opponents that can't be redeemed. I don't know what to do with those people. But I honestly think for a, a not insignificant amount of people, they are enthusiastically choosing the dispossession and extinction of their group. And it, that extends even to their own children. And they will chase that right to the bottom. I don't know what percentage of the larger group that is, but those people I don't think can be helped. I think they're just... A cancer. How they got there? Well, you can say extreme ideological possession. You could say extreme ignorance. I treat extreme ignorance and malice as basically the same thing. They have the same effect. I don't care. One is not more innocent than the other, in my view. There's a certain amount of people where I can't do anything with you. You're too far gone, and then exile them or something. But it's up to us to figure well, out what, what, what can if, be done if, with them. If my understanding of the situation is even remotely correct, I think a lot of those people are going to come out of this like coming out of a spell because they, they have been possessed. And I'm calling it the spirit of the devouring mother or the smothering mother. Um, you can call it whatever you want. But it, it is a form of psychological, spiritual, uh, egregoric possession. 
that as the people come out of this period and, and transition into a new spirit, the spirit of the vengeful son, they will shake off one spiritual manifestation and glom onto the other. Some will be stuck in it um, or permanently uh, changed, disabled by the old spirit. But the, you'll see a surprising number of people, just 180. Anna Kasparian, we're, we're talking about the Young Turks earlier. Anna Kasparian is the most perfect example of this, right? Super lib, super progressive. Yeah, if that makes me better than you, then I'm better than you. This, this, this screaming harpy woman almost gets raped on the streets of San uh, California, where the hell she is, by some homeless person. That starts to change in her. It starts a bit of a cascade failure. And now she's, I mean, a few shades away. She's, she's like in the same conversation as Laura Loomer, essentially. Like, yeah. Uh, trading, well, I mean, the, the difference there being that she's a woman and women don't have a opinions like we do like they know they, but they won't, do have vibes but they do have they, vibes they won't be soldiers their opinions so like they will kind of go with the flow more often than men but like there are men who will like fight and die for their opinion so that maybe i should say it's tilted more towards that based on gender maybe it's more men you know in that great book by ivan Elian on resistance to evil by force who i'm sure you're familiar with because you're an uh, an orthodox christian he says that the only way he was trying to um, respond to Tolstoy's more pacifist uh, view of Christianity, which is, you know, good always wins. To be on the side of good, to be on the side of Christ, you must not even engage in conflict with evil. And if it tramples you, then let it because God and Christ wins in the end. Uh, whereas Ivan Ilian was saying, like, no, it's your duty to interrogate evil because evil spreads like a cancer if left unchecked and some people call this characteropathic behavior or mental illness but in any event it spreads like a virus through institutions and throughout society unless it is interrogated by force and he goes into pretty exhaustive detail that look when you're interrogating evil by force maybe that leads to death so that is on the table if you have someone who is so ideologically possessed that they are willing to defend the dispossession and extinction of their group like you're dealing with people who are almost on the side of death and chaos and how do you some people wake up from that but at this i don't really buy into mass awakenings that much anymore there's people who are kind of on the fence like women but if people come around on trump that's one thing but have they come around on white people have they come around on what america represents have they come around on it's still bigger, trump's good but it's still we, we shouldn't still deport people you know like on any of the baseline issues, have they changed at all? In fact, Trump might have changed more, you know? I, I've, I've said this for a while now, that liberalism, the entirety of it, that's including communism, fascism, all the cults and all that stuff, is Luciferianism. It is Luciferian to its core. And what I mean by that is that it rests on producing and investing people's resentments and this desire to liberate yourself from all oppression. Uh, and if you don't have oppression, you find new ones. Part of what I think is happening too with that pride and that vainglory is that there's a large degree of people, and, and this really affects a lot of religious people as well, who seem to want the end times to happen in their lifetime because they can't deal with this idea of dying and the world going on without them. So they want everything to end in their lifetime so that nobody gets to go on and pass them. It's, uh, Christopher Hitchens once said something really interesting when he was sick and near the end of his life. He said that the, the thing to contend about dying is, is essentially that, is that you're in this big giant party and then you've been asked to leave, but you know the party will go on without you and you have to kind of grapple with that reality. And I feel that if we want to distill nihilist... You know, A very Hitchens Western quote, it's like everyone's that. drinking and sometimes you'll have to stop <laughs> drinking and that's scary. <laughs> right. <laughs> just we should have just told, convinced him that there was a there was you could smoke in heaven and maybe he would be, he'd be down with it. What was I going with? I, yeah, so I think the Western nihilism can be distilled down to that. Um, there's almost this des desire for destruction, uh, and I think that's just it's part of us. And maybe it's in all of us to a certain degree. But if you take that one sort of weird destruction kink and you magnify it within a group of people. And then those group of people end up having a disproportionate amount of influence in all of your inputs, like education and media and uh, entertainment. And they've been doing that for a very long time. And these same uh, psychopaths uh, think that everyone's coming to kill them and that everything's going to end anytime soon. Well, maybe that's why you get this messaging. When you wake up to that position, then 
it's like you have to go through everything. Everything you thought was how, how something worked isn't necessarily how it works. So you have to go through all of it and figure out what's going on. Maybe waking up is the realization that you deserve to die. If you're a woman who's had 12 abortions and she spent most of her life not only celebrating her abortions, but encouraging others around her to have abortions, and then she has the come to Jesus moment and realizes where she's wrong and says, how can I, what can I do? I'd say, I don't know. You've been a cancer and you stop being a cancer for five seconds and you're at coming to me for answers. You know, like to me, and this might sound too harsh, but, you know, there's a lot of individuals who have done some pretty insane things during COVID or, you know, turned on their families or betrayed their families. Like if I, we can liken this to a meth head too, like a meth head or a crackhead who's betrayed everyone in their lives for 30 years and then they get clean and they're like, well, I just want you to know I'm doing okay now. I don't fucking care. Tell me what you're going to do, make up for it, or you might as well just disappear. We don't need you. We've been doing okay. We've been right about fucking everything. What are you people bringing to the table? Um, repentance, true repentance, especially, let's, I'll just speak from the Orthodox perspective on this. Repentance means to, to turn around. So it literally means you return to the Father, this is the prodigal son idea, return to the Father to repent and be redeemed. Repentance here is an ongoing process. This is my, I, I've always said, the danger with the evangelicals or mush Christianity is thinking that if you just get dunked in the water, you come up and you're good. No, no, no. It's consistent, right? It's got to be con it conti it continual. So we repent by changing our behavior, right? We, we, we acknowledge behavior, we confess, we understand what we're doing wrong, or we begin to understand what we're doing wrong, and we start to change our behavior, our ways of being, so that we don't do those wrong things anymore. That's repentance. And that's how you are redeemed. That mechanism is the, mechanism, is the true mechanism of Christianity, and I think it's the one that's going to get glossed over a lot. Because people are flocking to the church. Part of my neo trans prediction was that one day very soon, and I think extremely soon now, you're going to wake up and you're going to see all these you know, blue-haired, screaming, ultra-feminist, trooned-up people wearing sundresses or frocks and making apple pies and talking about going to church. And this sort of mush Christian church will emerge. And that's a dangerous thing because and that's what why people I really them want at, is redemption and what they're going to settle for is like some sort of forgiveness. Yeah, and, and that's a, a fantastic point. I like the way you phrase that. Like they should be seeking redemption, but it's just they want forgiveness and change nothing about their behavior and almost don't admit that they were ever wrong to begin with. They were just misguided. And that's why mm -hmm. I just wanted to explain what you know, I said earlier that you need to have a true affection for these people, for the people that are, are often – you know, dismissed by by others. And that's why I group, the, the, the type of person I'm talking about, I would group in the, in the bucket of criminals in the sense that they are purposely leading to the chaotic nature and destruction of the group and they're doing so willingly. So that's why my, my fierce emotions towards them aren't just because they were misguided and I view them differently as some, someone who got hooked on pain pills in their small town or a woman who had too many kids maybe because she was sexually abused. Like I, I have an affection for those people but I'm grouping this one group which is that you are cancerous, you're toxic and I don't buy that you've really changed. You've just admitted that the world you created is not comfortable for you anymore. It's like the people who moved from California to Texas because they ruined California and they're just going to ruin Texas now. So I'm viewing you as a foreign pathogen. So you need to convince me that you are, <laughs> you're not infectious. You know what I mean? Otherwise, you need to get away. Away from yeah, this thing that we've, that we've created that seems to be on the right side of things. To put, the, to put it in a bit of a spectrum, let's say the degree of repentance, right? If there is such a thing, and a lot of this has to be happened between uh, the person, the, 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 this person and God, it has nothing to do with me. Let's say for cultural or civic repentance, there is a range here between someone who was just, you know, vaguely supportive of LGBT, blah 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 blah, please, you know, tune people plus, right, and other, and 
there's, so they, they, we'll put that on one side. And the other side of someone who actively trune their kids. That's a that's a fantastic example. And we haven't even talked about the women, the the women who abuse their children like that, you know. And and they're they're into the trans thing, not even because they believe in trans ideology. They have some kind of mutated form of Munchausen syndrome, where they just want to make their kids twisted and disfigured. You know what I mean? Like that type of person almost can never admit that they're wrong. And again, some people call this mental illness like a true sociopath. And again, this might be an, an anti-Christian point of view, but like a true sociopath, like can they ever be redeemed? Do they believe? Because they'll never admit to themselves that anything they've ever done is wrong. Like there's something in the, the their DNA, something in their code. And maybe you could say the the light of Christ can illuminate that. But I'm like, good luck, man. But there's there's just some some true darkness. In people, and I think, as uh, Ivan Alien said, if you were to interrogate that evil away, you might just interrogate the life force out of them. You know, and which is, I'm not even saying that's a good thing. It's just there has to be a, a case where that is that's true. And and what percentage of them is that? I don't know. Maybe it's a minority, but it's there. The difficulty going forward, especially with now this new spirit, this new energy, and and again the justification for this desire for vengeance and justice and what's the, the fine line between those two states. It, it's, it really comes down to discernment. And I think the majority of us lack that discernment. This is why I keep telling people that the danger of the vengeful son is it's going to feel good. And I know no one wants to hear that. Everyone thinks, yes, it's going to feel good and that's right. I'm like, no, it's going to feel good and that's bad. Because once you throw the first stone, then all the other stones will be thrown afterwards. The first stone is the hardest because it has not been modeled yet. As soon as the first stone has been thrown, then it will be have a model and people will, strict, will continue to throw stones. And what I'm seeing is this leads to an age of total violence. And again, that might sound sexy and good and at first, it probably is, right? Probably just, probably reasonable, probably, probably, a, probably the right thing to do and everyone's convinced of that. But then you flash forward 40, 60 years, and you don't want to live in that society because all of a sudden that's how you get Miramar. That's how you get police states. That's how you get a lot of these things that, you know, we would abstractly all agree we don't want. We don't want to live in that world. But that's how you get that world because the spirit yeah. that's being invoked is not on our side. It's just going to do what we ask it to do until it gets dominance and then it does the other thing it wants to do, which is destroy humanity. Well, what if you get the French Revolution, but you're not blessed with a Napoleon? Right. You know, well, you just get just, the Jacobins. <laughs> yeah, just Jacobins until they burn through everything. You know, and that's that is the cancer that spreads. Um, and I was referring to this great book called Political Ponderology, which casts exactly what I'm saying from a mental illness perspective, describing mm. characteropaths and saying that on a long enough timeline, it's inevitable for most social movements or even social institutions that they won't be hijacked by the most mentally ill member of uh, that institution, that they tend to rise to the top by being, being the thing that people find most attractive in people is being the, the most extreme, being the most radical being the most passionate, you know? <laughs> Sometimes these are markers of true psychopathy. And um, so I, I don't necessarily agree that it's inevitable, but they do tend to spread and corrupt those around them and turn the entire institution into an engine of human suffering. And mm -hmm. he was citing primarily the Soviet Union, but he was also describing Nazi Germany. He, he was describing any complex state, really, in a long enough timeline. So I think there is... There is something to that, that these people are, they're a reality and they will spread. And uh, they, they're they not, you know, talking to themselves in the mirror saying, yeah, ha, 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 you know, like they're not super villains like that. Like they think they're normal, but that's, that's the thing. Like they'll never, if you've ever met a habitual liar, you'll know what I'm talking about. And you'll see these people in your lives. You'll never, even if you catch them in a lie, there's no acknowledgement in their eyes. And you can look as deeply as you want. There's no acknowledgement that they've been found out. They'll just lie and lie and lie and then you become an enemy. And then it's it's this construct they build and they'll go to their grave thinking they were persecuted by their victims. 
You know what I mean? And so it's those people. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even taking pleasure in this. I'm saying they need to be put somewhere else because, you know, they, they can't be around regular people. Yeah, no, I agree. Let's end it there, my friend. Let the people know. Let the people know, Dimes, where they can get your stuff, all your stuff. First of all, thank you for having me on. This really turned into more of a rant episode than I intended. We didn't really get to all, some of the news that we we're going to talk about. So nah, I hope people, whatever. I hope people this found is, this. This is a dialogue show. We dialogue, man. We go where the conversation goes. Like if, you, if people want some sort of stylized, formatted, you know, professional show, there's there's options out there for just you. a title. Let, let me just say that what we're taking from this is that if we're discussing the relationship of Canada to an America. What we are doing in Canada right now is to appropriate an attitude, and it's coming across mm. as just a fandom. It's coming across as, oh, we can have, you know, the MAGA movement too. We can have the you have one year project twenty twenty five, and it can. It needs to be grown from within, and those are conversations that are occurring right now. But it needs to be within the Canadian context, so we can enjoy seeing what's happening in America, but. Don't make the mistake that this is just a spirit you can appropriate. We have to start with us actually getting as mad at the system that the Americans are, and I don't think we're as mad at our system as we should be. I think it's localized too much to Trudeau, and you made a good point that it's not just Trudeau. It, it goes wider than him. I just particularly don't like him. He's just the example of people should be more mad at him than they are, because if they can't muster up the anger towards him, then they can't muster up that sort of anger towards the system that is necessary to engage in the project that we're talking about. Anyway, bloodsatellite.ca is where you can find more from the show, Blood Satellite. Um, the Vanguardist Journal is our publishing website, vanguardistjournal.substack.com. And our merchandise store, goodsuffer.com. There you can buy a wide variety of shirts and merchandise from ourselves and also people that we partner with, including Jay Burden, Sunflower Society, Z-Man, and many others. Check all that out. There's a special shirt that we have on there right now called the Felted Lindy Waffen LLC shirt. Totally artisan made by uh, people in our space. Check it out. You'll like it. And uh, that's all the plugs I've got. Thank you, Dimes. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Always appreciate each and every one of you. I am Jason Marinchuk, and it is later than you think. Wellington Street. Nobody could tell how he managed such feet. We've tried every island from here to the moon, but Justin returns like a catchy tune. Sail to the isle where silence roams. Where coconut trees become his home. Wi-Fi or throne in gold, just endless sunsets to behold. Hey ho, ship him away, set a course, no time to stay, just it's taking a holiday, Canada can rest today.